Michael's Episcopal Church in Colonial Heights, Virginia. The collect is from the Canticle of Creation, from Prayers for the Domestic Church, written by Edward Hayes. In the beginning, Lord God, you alone existed, eternally one yet pregnant in the fullness of unity, full to overflowing, you, Father of all life, exploded outward in a billion bits and pieces. Your words became flesh, whirling in shining stars, shimmering suns, and in Genesis glimmering galaxies. You, my God, spoke, and your words became flesh. In sun and moon, earth and seas, mountains and gentle hills, rolling rivers and silent streams, you, my God, spoke, and your words became flesh, in winged bird, in deer and elephant, in grazing cow, racing horse, and fish of the deep. Your words, so unique and so varied, filled the earth also with rabbit, squirrel, and ant. And all your words were beautiful, and all were good. From each of these holy words arose a prayer of praise and adoration to you, their creator and wondrous womb. Praise you rang out the redwood. Blessed be you chimed in the cedar. Holy are you, praying the prairie grasses. From all four corners of this earth rose up a chorus of perpetual adoration. O sacred spirit, O divine breath of life, unseal my ears that they may ever listen to your continuous canticle of creation. Open my heart and my whole self to sing in harmony with all its many voices. Teach me to commune with your word, first made flesh, your creation, that I may be able to unravel the wondrous words of your second word made flesh, Jesus, through whom and with whom and in whom, I may see myself as another word of yours made flesh, to your honor and glory. Amen.
Let us pray. God within and beyond us all, teach us the silence of humility, the silence of wisdom, the silence of love, the silence of faith, the silence that enables reflection and speaks without words. Teach us, God, to silence our own hearts and minds, that we may listen for the movement of your Spirit within us and treasure your presence in the depths of our being. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God in Herod on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed this morning, Psalm 111, found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 754. We'll read responsibly by Holders. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and His righteousness endures forever. He makes His marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear Him. He is ever mindful of His covenant. He has shown His people the power of His works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of His hands are faithfulness and justice. All His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever.
Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and there is no one, no God, but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are and from whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through him whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an item, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your own family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This morning, on the fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany, we continue with the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' public ministry is now starting to snowball a little bit. It's starting to roll down the hill, and you can see it gathering volume. So in today's Gospel passage, Jesus makes the attempt to begin his teaching ministry in the synagogue because after all Jesus himself is Jewish. And so he goes into the synagogue and he begins to teach. Now the practice was that those who were viewed as holy people would get the permission of the local rabbi to teach in the synagogue and if they were well received, they could continue to teach. So Jesus does precisely this. And the response seems to have been overwhelming. The text says they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. So in his teaching ministry, which is the first thing that we know of in terms of Jesus' public ministry, that is, of a teacher, as one who unfolds the scriptures, he taught in a different way than the scribes taught, because what the scribes taught in the local synagogues were usually quotations from great and revered rabbis themselves that were recorded in a book called the Midrash. And the Midrash was a collection of all of the great rabbis, all of the great teachers of the Jewish law. Gamaliel, for example, was quoted by Paul, and Paul himself was one of the followers of Gamaliel, whose words are still recorded from memory in the Midrash. But Jesus did not speak. He did not teach in that way. And the difference is, is that Jesus spoke from his soul. It was less an exercise in memorizing who the great rabbis were and who were quoted from the Midrash about how to interpret a specific passage in the Jewish scriptures. It was more a sense that Jesus imparted the very essence of himself to the people. He spoke and taught and preached, you might say, from the soul. That's different from the scribes. And that kind of teaching was not only new to the people, but it made it more available to a lot more people because it wasn't an exercise in just intellectual knowledge. When Jesus taught in the synagogues, 
It was available to all peoples, regardless of education, regardless of gender, regardless of age, because he was communicating somehow through his spirit to others. It was to the other's spirit that Jesus was most effective. Great speakers still have that quality. We remember this time of the year, particularly Martin Luther King Jr. And Martin King Jr.'s greatest asset in his public speaking was that he spoke from his soul and it moved people. Who can forget that wonderful speech uh, at the March on Washington? That was over 50 years ago, and it still speaks to our spirits today. It was not necessarily geared towards the high and mighty. It was not necessarily geared for those whose intellect is that of Albert Einstein's. It was a speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave from his soul that communicated the message to everyone who could listen. And that means that the second part of Jesus' public ministry also comes into play in today's gospel passage, and that is healing. Because the text records that while he was still in the synagogue, believe it or not, a man had an unclean spirit, and this spirit cried out within the man, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? In other words, Jesus was speaking to the unclean spirit. He was communicating not only to the healthy, but to the non-healthy who were in the synagogue. And the unclean spirit speaks through this man, What have you to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus rebukes the Holy Spirit, the text says. And he says, be silent and come out of him. And there is the second part of Jesus' public ministry. The second part of Jesus' public ministry is that of healing. Now, that is not to say that Jesus is a modern-day neurosurgeon who can use all of the available instruments of technology to heal people. It's a different kind of healing. It's a spiritual cleansing. And it does not alleviate necessarily suffering and pain. It does not even explain how suffering and pain came to be. But rather what it does is it puts Jesus in the presence of pain and suffering. So that when we suffer, Jesus suffers along with us. And in that is to be found redemption. In that is to be found freedom. Into that is to be found an opportunity to be transported to be transfigured in a way, certainly to be transformed into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Jesus' healing ministry is about. It transports us from the things of this world to another realm, another way of being, which is called the kingdom of heaven. And then later on in all of the Gospels, Jesus talks about what it's like to be in the kingdom of heaven. That is Jesus' public ministry, an effort to show us that there is a yet a better way to live, another way to live that is finer and more noble than the current way that we live. So when Jesus confronts us, he does not confront us as a way of relieving our suffering, but rather placing himself in the midst of our suffering and say, I am with you. I understand. And it makes all the difference in the world. May God be with you today. May God guide you in both the teachings of Jesus and in the healing ministry of Jesus. Amen. This week, we are using the Creed from a Celtic Primer, and it reads as follows. 
Our God is the God of all humans, the God of heaven and earth, the God of sea and rivers, the God of the sun and moon, the God of all the heavenly bodies, the God of the lofty mountains, the God of the lowly valleys. God is above the heavens, and he is beneath the heavens. Heaven and earth and sea and everything that is in them, such he has as his abode. He inspires all things. He gives life to all things. He stands above all things, and he stands beneath all things. He enlightens the light of the sun. He strengthens the light of the night and the stars. He makes wells in the arid land and dry islands in the sea, and he places the stars in the service of the greater lights. He has a son who is co-eternal with himself and similar in all respects to himself. And neither is the son younger than the father, nor is the father older than the son. And the Holy Spirit breathes in them. And the father and the son and the Holy Spirit are all inseparable. Amen. Amen. Prayers of the People, Form 2, found on page 385 of the Book of Common Prayer. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for those among us who have requested prayer. Rachel, Paula, Savannah, Cookie, Lisa, Eric, Derek, Jay, the Colwyn family, Ken, Joshua, Brian, Tatum, Carlin, Christine, Rick and Cree, Christia, Sharon, Mary Lynn, Barbara, Karen, Becky, Colleen, Alice, Cindy, Linda, Ron, and Tom. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your thanksgiving for those who celebrated their birthday this past week, especially Mary Lynn Schwartzer and Catherine Noakes, and for those celebrating their wedding anniversary. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Remaining standing, let us say together the Lord's Prayer in the traditional form. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Creator bless you and keep you. May the beloved compassion face you and have mercy upon you. May the eternal Spirit's countenance be turned to you and give you peace. And may the three in one bless you. Amen.